What's the last one? I need to know. I don't want to know, but I need to know. Okay. Intercourse, Pennsylvania. <laughs> like. Okay. Welcome to Electric Enthusiasm, the podcast where we celebrate unironic enthusiasm. I am a semi professional adult coloring book, Katie Kobold. And I am Alexander Kyoth, a human being so edgy I don't have a single tattoo. <laughs> so how does this podcast work, Alex? In each episode, one of us has prepared a topic that they are super enthusiastic about and will do their best to spread that enthusiasm to the other host and to you, the listener. We also have a special guest who is excited about something that we know nearly nothing about. We also have a moment of meta where we get enthusiastic about enthusiasm and talk a little bit about why enthusiasm matters and how to live a more enthusiastic life. And we want to hear about your enthusiasms. Visit our website, electricenthusiasm.com or our Instagram at electricenthusiasm and tell us what you're enthusiastic about these days. Or you can even plain old send us an email at hello at electricenthusiasm. Dot com. Um, Katie, did we get that fax number set up as well, or...? You're just teasing me because I wanted to have an email. I get it. I'm the millennial who decided an email was a good idea, but I maintain emails and newsletters are still excellent and still very useful in this day and age. In this episode, our topic is Harpo Marx. As always, one enthusiast, that's me, has checked the topic with the other host ahead of time just to make sure that they're not already secretly the world's leading authority on it. So Katie, what came to your mind when I first said Harpo Marx? I think this is going to be one of those topics that really shows our generational differences. Is it the thing with the glasses, the fake nose and the mustache? Or uh -huh. is that Groucho Marx? And if so, are they different? Are they related? I <laughs> know nothing. Uh, I feel like he... He, I'm assuming it's a he, I think Harpo, yeah. I've heard the name and I'm pretty sure it's not Groucho Marx and that's about all I got for you. Excellent. Oh, you're a blank slate. I love it. This is such oh. a treat for me to get to share my love of, <laughs> of Harpo Marx. Okay, so what is Harpo Marx? Why is it awesome? There are three reasons why I am super enthusiastic about Harpo Marx and I'd like to share two of them now and then save one for the end, if that's okay, okay. with you. Okay, go. So, Wait, is he related to Groucho Marx? Was I wrong? Was I right? Yes. No, you're yes! exactly right. <laughs> I knew a thing. I knew one thing. <laughs> yes. yes. Harpo and his brothers were comedic geniuses. They worked on stage and in movies at the same time as people like Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, and even among people like that, they more than hold their own, and their comedy still holds up to this day. They were, in fact, brothers, Katie. Very good. I knew yes, one thing. And I knew one thing. <laughs> and I was not wrong about the one thing I knew. Did they exactly. have the mustache? Was that a thing as well? Did they no, have mustache? Well, that, that was Groucho. So oh just, just to go over it. The three most famous Marx brothers, and they were actually brothers in real life, were Groucho, who had the huge mustache, the huge eyebrows, and the glasses. He was the funny, quibby one, always ready with a smart insult. Then there is Chico. It's, it's spelled Chico, but it's pronounced Chico. We'll get into why. Who was this fake Italian character with absolutely no limitations, who could say and do whatever and, and would often play the piano in their stage appearances and movies. And finally, there was Harpo, so named because he played the harp, but also never spoke on stage. And he relied on pantomime and he could communicate so well and so beautifully just with his face, with his gestures, with, uh, with like a horn, a honk, or by whistling. It's, it's amazing. Their movies are, are comedic masterpieces. So that's absolutely one reason. But way beyond that, and even if you've never seen a single Marx Brothers movie, you can still appreciate the way Harpo lived his life. In Danish, we have a word called Ljuskunstner. 
And yes, I will probably in every single episode find a way to sneak in a Danish word. Lius <laughs> kunstner. Uh, in Danish, liu means life. A uh, kunstner is an artist. So in a uh, lius kunstner is a life artist. And like a painter can make a painting that is beautiful and meaningful and inspiring. Uh, a life artist can live their life in a way that is beautiful and meaningful and inspiring. And Harpo absolutely did that. 20 something years ago, I found his autobiography in a secondhand bookstore. And I honestly couldn't tell you why I bought it, but I did. And it completely blew me away. Let me just read the, the very first couple of sentences from his autobiography and it'll illustrate what I mean. I don't know whether my life has been a success or a failure, but not having any anxiety about becoming one instead of the other and just taking things as they come along, I've had a lot of extra time to enjoy life. I think that is one of the most beautiful ways to approach life that I have ever heard. And it certainly was not in the cards that he would grow up like that. Harpo was born in 1888 in the U.S. to a Jewish family. And he had a tough childhood. He was thrown out of school. This is not a euphemism. He was literally thrown out the window. <laughs> he had two classmates, a, a big Irish kid and an even bigger Irish kid who for fun would pick him up and throw him out of the window. Now, luckily, this was on the ground floor, but he'd still catch hell from the teacher for leaving the classroom without permission. One day they do it and he's like, I've had enough. And he just never goes back to school. He was eight years old. He then grew up on the streets of New York. They lived on, on 89th Street in on Manhattan, the Upper East Side. Fancy today, very much not fancy back then. And if you're alone, Jewish kid on the sidewalk, that's, that's not going to go well for you. His family was very poor when he grew up. There wasn't food on the table every day, but they, they did their best. Then at one point, he gets his first showbiz gig. He auditions for a lady who needs a piano player, and she hires him to play the piano in her whorehouse in Long Island. He was 14 or 15 years old at the time. Hearing this, you don't think this is a person who's going to grow up happy, well-adjusted and, and, and positive, but I he mean, absolutely was. I mean, it's not, it's not unheard of to have comedians with very sad lives and like with very difficult lives because is it the, the old saying, the old adage, comedy is tragedy plus time. And so you hear all these stories about comedians who have had d deep depression or very difficult social anxiety, but through comedy and through performance, they're able to process that in such a way. Maybe it's partly because he has such a difficult upbringing that's caused him to have this ability to share so much joy because he had to process that trauma. He would absolutely say that, but I think more than that, he doesn't see a lot of that as trauma because mm -hmm. he has this unique ability of looking back and seeing the positive. Let me read you a passage from the first chapter of his autobiography, which illustrates that perfectly. I can't remember ever having a bad meal. I've eaten in the finest restaurants in Paris, but the absolutely most delicious food I ever ate was prepared by the most inspired chef I ever knew, my father. My father had to be inspired because he has so little to work with. I can't remember ever having a poor night's sleep. I've slept in the mansions of the Vanderbilts and in jail. I've slept on pool tables, dressing room tables, piano tops, bathhouse benches, and heart cases. I can't remember ever seeing a bad show. If I'm trapped in a theater and a show starts disappointingly, I have a handy way to avoid seeing it. I fall asleep. <laughs> I, I thought that was going to end so uplifting. I thought it was going to be like, and then I find some beauty in the performance and I, I look and see. No, he falls asleep. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you compare him with his brothers, they all had very interesting lives, but I wouldn't say necessarily that his other brothers were very happy. Groucho was a grouch, always seeing the negative in things. His brother Chico had a massive gambling problem that ended up costing him millions of dollars. Harpo, on the other hand, is probably the happiest person in Hollywood. 
Everybody loved him. Everybody wanted to spend time with him because he was such a nice person. This is from the back of his autobiography. I've played piano in a whorehouse. I've smuggled secret papers out of Russia. I've sat on the floor with Greta Garbo, horsed around with the Prince of Wales, played ping pong with George Gershwin. He also ended up being friends with people like George Bernard Shaw, W. Somerset Maugham, and I had one more. Oh, yeah. Salvador Dali. Whoa. That was maybe his most impressive feat, that he managed to become a Hollywood celebrity and remain a nice person. I like that. That's really wonderful. That's a rare skill to have in the world. Hollywood or no, like to be a, the type of person that holds space for others and has empathy. Okay. 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 I like him. So far, I like him. I know nothing about his comedy, but I really like him. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Okay. So just for clarity's sake, those are the two reasons that you like Harpo Marx. Yes? Yes. Comedic genius and lived a super interesting, super happy life. All right, cool. Interesting. Hmm. Instead of just, you know, listing all of the stuff he did chronologically, that's super boring. I want to focus on five aspects of Harpo Marx. Yes. So first, Harpo the vaudevillian. Then Harpo the Intellectual. Uh, then we have Harpo Marx the Prankster. Ooh, I'm excited about that one. I'm excited about that one already. Yes. <laughs> he was an amazing prankster. Then we have Harpo the Nudist. So uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and finally, Harpo the Dad. Aww, we're going to end all cute. Yes. Let's start with Harpo the Vaudevillian, shall we? Mm -hmm. Their mother forces the brothers into vaudeville. They don't want to. They have to. They become a singing act, which is a bit of a problem because they are honestly not very good singers. But she's determined. She pushes them on the road. And it was grueling. Yeah. What they had to do was, you know, take the train to some random little town somewhere in the U.S., find the local theater and ask, hey, can we perform here tonight for a cut of the tickets? Go around town and actually you know, tell people there's a show, come see it, then do the show. Hopefully you've made enough money for a place to sleep and a meal to eat and a ticket on to the next town. This life was absolutely grueling and they did it for five years. And then one evening, everything changes. And depending on who you believe, this either happened in Ada, Oklahoma, or in Nacoc Dochis, Texas, they're performing and suddenly a man comes running into the theater and goes, there's a mule loose. And everybody runs out of the theater because that's apparently better entertainment than the Marx Brothers singing. Somebody catches the mule and the audience files back in and the Marx Brothers are pissed. So they go completely off script and they start insulting the audience every way they can imagine. And the audience loves it. From that evening on, their act starts changing and it becomes anarchic, chaotic. Every step of the way, it's improvised. And that's when they get funny. And that's when they start being successful because of a mule in either Ada, Oklahoma or in Nacoc, Dochis, Texas. <laughs> nice. I like this idea. Like, it reminds me of like, the modern day roast in a stand-up comedy setting, but also in a, a drag or ballroom setting, you have like reading this idea of comedy through insult it stood the test of time it is definitely something that is still as funny today as it probably was by a mule back then <laughs> these are awesome city names right nakak dochis how cool is that by the way there are some really unusual american town names do you know any no, I'm not so enlightened on the, the American geography side of things. I found three that I really like. How about Satan's Kingdom, Vermont? You what? Excuse me? Excuse <laughs> me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, what? <laughs> yes, there is a small village in Vermont called Satan's Kingdom. Why? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. And nobody knows. Nobody but knows. Okay. But it's there. Sure. Um, how about this? Truth or consequences, New Mexico? 
Y'all, America needs to stop. We, <laughs> like the great, the great experiment's over. It's over. We, 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 it's, it's done. It's done. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. What's the last one? I need to know. I don't want to know, but I need to know. Okay. Intercourse, Pennsylvania. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, I can't say anything. There's a part of London called Cockfosters. So, but still, guys. But still, yeah. God. See, okay. I'm currently in Hong Kong, but I spent a lot of time growing up somewhere in the east in a part of town called Happy Valley. Which sounds like it came from like a Disney show. Like it said like, and here the little Tweedledums live in Happy Valley, but it's the actual place name. And it kind of one of those things that got transliterated across from Chinese into English. Calling something a Happy Valley in Chinese is not super weird, but in English, it does sound kind of adorable and kind of weird. Um, I, I could live in Happy Valley. You totally could. You would love it. It's great. There's a really good bakery Un there. Yeah. Unless it's one of those twist kind of deals where it turns out that the reason it's happy is that they sacrifice their firstborn every, you know, every spring on the first new moon or whatever. I mean, I was never there on the first new moon and I survived. So, so, um, during, uh, Harpo's vaudeville period to get back to the original point. Yes. <laughs> We're now back to the original topic after we had a, by the way, inside a, by the way, and then I did a, by, by the, the way, to talk about half Valley. That was a triple, by the way, by the way, exception. Um, so three major changes happened to Harpo in their vaudeville times. First of all, he stopped speaking on stage. They were performing. Uh, they got a beautiful review. Like this was an amazing show. And the performer known as Harpo was fantastic on stage until he opened his mouth. Yeah. So that reviewer hated his voice. And Harpo decides, okay, screw it. I'm not talking on stage ever again. And he never did. He never again uttered a single word on stage or in any of their many, many movies. Wow. And it's nearly impossible to find recordings of his voice. I found one. Can you play it? Can we hear it? Yes, I can. It's a recording for his autobiography. And you remember how I said he was a piano player in a whorehouse at the age of 14 or 15. This is the story of how he lost that job. And I felt sick, and I practically keeled off the stool. And she says, get that son of a bitch back on that stool. Play. I had to a couple of customers here. So again, I fell off the stool. She said, what the hell is the matter with him to one of the girls? And she said, well, he must be sick. So they sent for a doctor, and he looked at me, the doctor, and he said, he's got the measles. She said, get him the hell out of here. I don't want any sick Jews around me. Did you say, like, I don't want any sick children or sick Jews? Sick Jews around here. Okay, so I did hear it correctly. I was really hoping I heard it wrong. No, nope, Also, nope. I was expecting, like, if he got such a negative review, I was expecting his voice to be, like, really nasal or have some affect or some quality that was... But his voice is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that voice. Absolutely not. The second change that happened to him was that one day a huge package arrives for him from his mom. He opens it and it's a harp. He's never expressed any interest in playing the harp. He's never played the harp before, but now he owns a harp. So he starts practicing. And just a few weeks later, it's now part of the act. He actually gets pretty good at it and has played the harp in all of their movies. Question. Did she get him a harp? just because his name is Harpo. No, that it was the other way around. Oh, so what was his name before? That's a very good question. He actually changed his name twice in his life because he was born Adolf. Hmm. Yeah, and that's not a good name to have. Now, the interesting thing is that he decides to change it in 1911, so way before Hitler. Um, yeah. He does, just doesn't like the sound of Adolf. He decides he wants to be called Arthur, changes his name to that. So good call, nice dodge on that yeah. one, right? That was a little bit of a foreseeing the future moment there, Harpo. Nice job. Yes. So through most of his vaudeville days, he's known as Arthur. Then one night, they are playing poker backstage. And there's this comedian who's, who's dealing the cards. And he deals a card to Arthur and says, uh, you know, a card for Harpo. 
Now he has to do everyone at the table, right? Now he's committed. So two card for Harpo. Uh, next is Leonard. Um, and Leonard is always chasing the women. So he becomes Chico. Yeah. Next up is Julius. And he's always carrying his money in this little grouch bag, this little folded up a suede bag with a leather thong around it. So he becomes Groucho. I've never heard of that type of bag being called a grouch before. That's a new one for me. That may have been a thing from the, we're, we're back in the 1910s here. So that's how they got their names and ended up performing by those names through the rest of their career. And that happened in a poker game. That is a beautiful origin story for a name change. I like that. Yes. So that's Harpo the Vaudevillian. The Vaudevillian. Am I correct? Is it Harpo the Intellectual next? Well, it is, but there's a, there's a by the way. <gasps> of course there is. <laughs> of course there is. Why did I think so, that we didn't have yes. by the way? So, by the way, did you know that there were some truly weird vaudeville acts? Actually, I did. I do know quite a bit about vaudeville because it's part of like the dance history kind of thing. But what are some weird vaudeville acts that you know? So my favorite vaudeville acts is the Whitman Sisters because they played a lot with gender and race as part of their performances because they were black but white passing and one of them was a fantastic male impersonator. They used to have an act where two of the sisters would dance together and then remove their costuming to show they were both women as opposed to a man and a woman. So like cross-dressing and like playing with gender and what is a black person, what is a white person. That was amazing. So I love the Whitman sisters. They're my favorite vaudeville act. Also, it's because of them. We have people like Count Basie in show business. So gotta love what? the Whitman sisters. How did, how, how did that happen? Uh, he started playing with them. They were considered to be one of the best places to start off a career. Bill Bojangles Robinson and a bunch of other performers all got their start with the Whitman Sisters tour because they were seen as a safe place to send your kids. So if you have a talented child and you want them to go on the vaudeville circuit, you don't want them to go by themselves. But for women who look after your kids, make sure that you know the women remain chaste and virginal and that everyone does their homework and they're very maternal, you'll send your kid to the Whitman Sisters and they'll get performance experience. Wow. Did so, not know that. The interesting thing about vaudeville is that you could go to some places that were not yet accepted in main society. For instance, we have Ethel Pertle. And Ethel Pertle performed on the Wall of Death, you know, that cylindrical thing where they would ride motorcycles or cars around and they could yeah. actually drive it up the wall. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's wild enough. She would drive the car around with her pet Lion King in the passenger seat. Okay, sure. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, Ethel. It's no sense of safety for you or your lion. The single weirdest vaudeville act has got to be Joseph Pujol, who was actually a headline act at the Moulin Rouge for uh, two years and then traveled all over Europe. He was known as uh, Le Petoman. Any guesses what he did on stage? My French is not very good. I'm, I, I don't think I know what Petoman would be. No. Okay, he was a flatulist. He farted. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes, that's so stupid and I love it. Yes, his act was everything from impressions to melodies. Uh, he could blow out candles. Um, yeah, that's so, actually, so that's... Okay, that I'm sorry. Doing impressions and melodies through farting, that is a talent. That is a skill. I, yes... Okay, I buy this as a talent. I buy it as a skill. I don't think I know anyone who could fart a melody. I approve. I approve of this entirely. <laughs> yes. There is one 20-second clip of him performing. And I think it's one of the world's greatest tragedies that it's a silent movie. No! So we can see him, <laughs> but we can't hear him. And no. it's, you know... <laughs> oh... Oh, technology, you have forsaken us so. Exactly. All righty, so that was Harper Marx, the vaudevillian. Now we come to Harper Marx, the intellectual. And given that he was thrown out literally of school in second grade, you might wonder how the hell did that happen? The Marx brothers got good, and they finally get their first performance in New York City. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the local newspapers need to review this. At the New York Times, there was a reviewer called Alexander Woolcott. He's the drama critic 
So he gets this uh, assignment, you go review this new show by the Marx Brothers. And he's like, I don't want to, this is stupid. I, I review serious art. These are a bunch of acrobats or comedians. I don't want to do it. But he, he goes to one of his coworkers like, could you do it? The coworker goes, I oh, you know I'd love to, but I can't, I have a date tonight. And finally he has to give up and oh, I, I guess I have to go see it now. By the way, when he arrives at the theater, that coworker is there with his date. <laughs> And that's, that's well played. Smart. Now, I think the best word for Alexander Woolcott is pompous. This was a smart guy. He knew he was smart. He liked everybody around him to know that he was smart. He goes in and sees the show and he is blown away. And he writes this glowing review the next day for the New York Times. And especially, he loves Harpo. Has Harpo stopped talking at this point? Is Harpo speaking or is he not speaking? This is after he stopped speaking, so okay. completely in pantomime, and, and he really appreciates his physical comedy. Woolcott calls him up on the phone in this very pompous way. Might I have the honor of visiting you in your dressing room after tonight's performance? And Harpo is like, this guy sounds funny. I can have some fun with him, and says yes. And they actually become lifelong friends, yeah. uh, despite their differences, or maybe because of their differences. Who knows? And... Alexander Woolcott then introduces him to something called the Algonquin Round Table. Famous intellectuals would meet at this hotel every day to play cards or just to, you know, talk and hang out. Noel Coward was there regularly, Dorothy Parker, um, a guy called Harold Ross, who went on to uh, start the New Yorker magazine. So a lot of the, the top minds of the time. And they all loved Harpo because he had one skill that none of them had. He could shut up and listen. I can totally see how pompous people who think they're the smartest people in the room would love someone to just shut up and listen to them. Okay, that tracks. That tracks. Yes. And that's how he ends up hanging out with all these terrific people and actually gets an education from them and becomes well-versed in art and literature and history and politics simply by assimilating it from all of them. He was not stupid. He just never got an education until then. And that brings me to Harpo Marx the Prankster. But first, this episode is sponsored by Heart Count. Are people in your workplace enthusiastic about their jobs? Or are all of your best coworkers planning to quit just as soon as they can? Companies that use HeartCount don't have to guess. With a simple, weekly, scientifically proven 20-second survey, you get exact data on what employees feel and think about their jobs so you can build a happier and more successful workplace. Visit HeartCount.com to try it in your organization free of charge. That's heart as in muscle, not hard as in difficult. Because in the best workplaces, every heart counts. Harpo would do anything for a good prank. Alexander Woolcott invites Harpo to dinner at his place for the first time. And then he goes, and I would be delighted if you would invite your brothers along, provided, of course, that they act like perfect gentlemen. Harpo knows, oh yeah, yeah, now we're, now we're off to the races. So dinner has started. The Mox Brothers aren't there yet. Alexander Woolcott is very into punctuality. He is furious. And suddenly they hear this loud racket from outside. He opens the door. And there are the four Marx Brothers on a traveling carousel. They brought a merry-go-round and they're horsing around on it. Yes, that's how far that man would go for a, for a prank. Later in life, he's living in Hollywood and he's playing golf at the Hillcrest Golf Club with George Burns, who was another of the famous comedians at the time. It's a hot day, so after a couple of holes, they take off their shirts and play the remaining round shirtless. And then, of course, they get a sternly worded letter from the golf club saying, that is against the bylaws. You must have a shirt on when you play. Now, when they come back, they've read the bylaws very carefully. So they go out, and on the first tee, they take off their pants because there is no rule in the golf club bylaws against playing without pants on. So they play 18 holes without pants and there's nothing the club can do about it. I love that because both my parents are avid golfers and I used to get dragged to the golf course as a little kid and I hated 
having to wear like the golfing outfits. And I wish, I wish I had the bravery of Harper Marks to just rock up pantsless and just be like, this is how I'm playing golf. This is it's my choice of golf now. So I really, I appreciate his bravery on that front. I wish I had that. And he absolutely did have that. Um, Cause now we're coming to Harper Marks, the nudist. Yes. Yes. I've always found the concept of nudism fascinating. I, I think it would be weird at first at least, uh, but for Harpo, no problem, okay? At one point after he's successful in living in Hollywood, he's uh, lying by the swimming pool in California on a super hot day with his friend, uh, Charlie Lederer, who was a uh, writer and director. And they're like, it's too hot. I wonder what Alexander Woolcott is up to. He was summering on his own private island in New England. So they jump on a plane, uh, go to New York. That's three stops by plane back then. They charter a water plane to get taken up to the island. They get in a little boat, sail up to the island. Alexander Woolcott is there with some of their friends. They're playing croquet out on the lawn. Uh, they hide in the bushes, take off all their clothes. They run out naked, screaming and yelling like savages. Um, Alexander Woolcott goes, Alice, I believe it's your shot. <laughs> they get back in the bushes, put on their clothes, take the boat back, take the seaplane back, take the airplane back to San Francisco, back to the pool, and they go, I thought Alexander looked pretty healthy. What do you think? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Just one more. When they were filming their movie Horse Feathers in 1932, they had a huge stadium of extras for the big finale. And they, they had a lot of reshoots. So the extras were getting like restless, antsy. Yeah. So what does Harpo do? Takes off all his clothes and starts running laps around the stadium, buck naked. I mean, the thing is as well, like the fact that he doesn't speak. And so for him, the way to emote and to, and to communicate is through his body. And so he's clearly all about like, if I'm only going to talk with my body, you better see all of my body. And you could. <laughs> and finally, we come to Harper Marks, the dad. Through his 30s and 40s in Hollywood, he was a notorious womanizer. Finally, he gets chased down by this one woman, this actress called Susan Fleming. Uh, he falls in love with her. They get married. And for whatever reason, and I just, I, in all of my research, I've not been able to figure out why they can't have kids themselves, but they end up adopting four kids, no less. At one point, George Burns asks him, so how many kids do you want? And he says, I want one kid for every window in my house so that when I go to work, there'll be a kid in every window waving goodbye. Aww. The love between the Marxists, Susan and Harpo, and their children is undeniable. When you see interviews of, of their grown children uh, talking about their childhood or talking about their parents, it is, it is obvious that there was unconditional love there. When you see the children of Chico and Groucho talking about their upbringing, there's still love, but it's qualified, right? You know, my dad was a complicated man, but of yeah. course I loved him. Harpo, on the other hand, was completely accepting of his children. He loved them so much. When he came home like two in the morning after a long day of shooting a movie, he was like, I, I need to see my kids. He'd go wake one of them up and, and just spend some time playing with them, then put them back to bed because <laughs> he had to spend time with his kids. Like I said, every single, every single child was adopted, three boys and a girl. And a choice you face when you adopt children is when do you tell them that they're mm -hmm. adopted? And they decided that they would do it as soon as they were able to understand any kind of language. So they did the most amazing things. They turned it into a bedside story. Mm -hmm. And they told the story of, you know, we were looking for a boy. We, we wanted a boy called William, who would be this perfect boy with blonde curly hair. We looked for him everywhere and we simply couldn't find him. And then our doctor was, I think I found him. And we went to look and it was him and we brought him home and we were so happy with him. Mm -hmm. But then we were like, Bill needs a brother. Bill is going to be lonely. So where could we find a brother who would be Alex, who would have dark hair, who would, again, describing that child. Yeah. And then we went out and found him. We brought it home. And the other two kids were sitting there waiting when is my turn? When is my turn? Yeah. And, and they wouldn't go to sleep without what, what was simply called the story. That's so endearing. At one point, Minnie, the daughter named after his mom, comes home and says, one of my classmates asked me the dumbest question. She asked me, what's it like to be adopted? 
And I said, it's not like anything except that, you know, your parents just had you. My parents picked me out of thousands of other children. And then the daughter, Minnie, goes, oh, I I hope I didn't make her feel bad that she's not adopted. (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet. One of my um, best friends growing up, she was adopted. And she got told every day on her birthday. It was a ritual. Every day on their birthday, they would sit her down and like tell her the story of how they saw her and like the instant connection her mom felt when she saw this little girl for the first time and how tightly that hug felt. And I remember her telling me every day. So on your birthday, how do your parents tell you like how you were picked and how you were chosen? And I was like, mom, I'm on my birthday. Why didn't you tell me about when I was chosen? My mom was like, you, you, you weren't chosen, sweetie. We, we just had you. Um, I was the little kid that talked to Minnie in that story. I was that little kid who went home that day and was like, mom, dad, when did you choose me? Like, when did I get chosen? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the pain of not being adopted. I wasn't adopted. (laughs) (laughs) There should be like a support group or something for (laughs) non-adoptees. For those of us who were not chosen, who just were had. Yes. So he was without a doubt a fantastic husband. There was true love between him and his wife and their children. More than anything, I think that period of his life defines him, how he could adjust to that and take everything he'd learned from vaudeville and from the intellectuals and from pranking and bring that into a, a, a deep and beautiful and, and happy family life. I think if I admire one thing about him, it's that. Yeah. So coming towards his end of his life, he has a heart attack. And now he's forced to retire. So no playing the harp, no playing golf, um, no performing, no performing at all. Yeah. And his life kind of sucks. He goes back to performing and dies of a heart attack a few years later on his 28th uh, anniversary. Wow. 28th anniversary, wedding anniversary or performance anniversary or some other anniversary? Good question. 28th wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. Harpo's remains were cremated at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and a portion of his ashes were allegedly scattered in the sand trap at the seventh hole of a golf course in California. (laughs) And, like, I'm assuming if he he was cremated, the clothes probably vaporized in the crematory, so he was probably pantsless, those ashes. He was what? Well, clothes will vaporize in a crematory, so... Those ashes that were scattered were definitely naked. Therefore, living up one final time to Harpo Marx, the nudist. One final naked round of golf. Yeah. I love it. So that was just one hell of a life. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on, wait a minute. You said there were three reasons you were enthusiastic about Harpo. What yes. was the third? So... I wish I was Harpo, but if I were one of the Marx Brothers, if there was like a BuzzFeed quiz, which Marx Brother are you? I would probably be Groucho. I am. I'm definitely an overthinker. I'm definitely too cerebral. I'm I'm too invested in looking smart Mm. um, and, and, and having other people acknowledge that. But I want to be more of a Harpo. And learning about his life has taught me a lot about the value of just being silly, of just being kind, of not caring what other people think, and of just doing whatever. Now, am I ready to play golf naked? Probably not. (laughs) But I think a lot of us overthinkers and perfectionists can learn a lot from the way Harpo lived his life. And, And he got so much out of just being himself. Mm. And that is the highest art in life. I like that. I like that a lot. There's a piece of advice that often gets tossed around, particularly in the Dry Grace universe, for those of you who like RuPaul's Dry Grace, which is this idea of like figure out who you as a person are and then just do that. Do that with intention. And that's all you need to do in this world. It's obviously incredibly difficult to figure out who you are. Once you got that out, that's like a whole mission. But once you've got that, just do that with intention. It sounds like that's what Harpo did. 
He figured out who he was yes. and just did it over and over again. Yes. Mm. That's very much what he did. Okay, so Katie, what resonated most with you about Harpo Marx? I think the thing that I like most about Harpo from what you've told me is the ability to shut up and to let the rest of the world speak around you and use that as a way to communicate. So like both his onstage persona of using honking sounds and like creating pantomimes with his face and his body, but then also that carrying through his time as an intellectual and learning from others and like just shutting up and listening. Like you, I, I aspire to be like Harpo in that regard. I tend to run my mouth a lot and I need to learn to shut up more. And it's something I've been very deliberately doing with my interpersonal relationships, my friendships and my partnerships is trying to create space to actively listen to my friends. And so, yeah, I like that about him. I like that both his onstage persona and his real life, who he was, was all about this idea of listening and not speaking. And that's something I really like and admire. And I, I think nobody did it better than him, the not speaking part on stage and in his and in his private life. Yeah. So if I wanted to learn more about Harpo Marx, what should I do? Where should I start? You should absolutely start by watching some of their movies because they are amazing. There are a lot of them, but I would say, say Night at the Opera and Horse Feathers. So go watch those. Those are amazing. After their movies, obviously Harpo's autobiography. It's called Harpo Speaks and it is amazing. If you like any of these stories, there's a million more in the book. He did lead the most amazing life and he describes it in, in amazing detail. Uh, and apart from that, we'll include some more links in the notes for this episode that you can find on our website at electricenthusiasm.com with more clips and information about the Marx Brothers and Vaudeville and possibly even weird U.S. city names. So what did you think about Harpo Marx? What can we learn from how he lived his life? Are you also drawn to nudism? Do you have any questions or did we leave out something awesome about Harpo? Go to our website electricenthusiasm.com or on Instagram at electricenthusiasm and tell us what you thought. Okay, are you ready for our moment of meta? I am so ready for some meta. So today's moment of meta, I wanted to talk about the name Electric Enthusiasm, where it came from, what my inspirations were behind it, because it was like one of the names that I pitched to you and it was one that you were drawn to. And so I want to talk about why I, it was one of the names that I pitched and then hopefully you can share with me why you were super drawn to it as a name as well. So one of the first things I did was I start looking up quotes about enthusiasm. The first one is from Gordon Parks, who was an American photographer. Enthusiasm is the electricity of life. How do you get it? You act enthusiastic until you make it a habit. I just love this Ooh. idea of like, how do you get this? Just be enthusiastic and it'll become part of your life. And through that, it'll just bring this energy, this excitement into your world. And then also I wanted to look into a little bit more of an academic approach, not just an artistic or creative approach. So this is from an article on enthusiasm by Judy Williamson, who is the director of the Napoleon Hill Learning Center at Purdue University Calumet. A certain charisma develops within the enthusiastic person. The crowd responds to the electricity that this person generates when they walk into a room, address a crowd, deliver a speech, or just work for a cause. Enthusiasm becomes a catalyst for change when it is sincere. People jump on the bandwagon of an enthusiastic person because they want to feel the energy for themselves. Greatness demands enthusiasm. To be enthusiastic, act enthusiastically. Allow yourself to feel the energy and lightness of being that develops when you embrace higher vibrations of your spirit. Ooh, I love those. And there's a lot in common here. It's not just the electricity. It's also the focus on acting. Yes. Enthusiasm is something you do. And it's when you do it and when you share it with others that it becomes something higher. I love that. I also love the, the whole 
um, a certain charisma develops within the enthusiastic person. I find myself drawn to those people. Those people are amazing. Those people who are not afraid to be excited about something and show it outwardly and take the risk that lies in being genuinely for something, genuinely excited and enthusiastic about whatever that might be. I love those people. Mm. And if I can bring in just one more moment of Danishness into this. I um, couldn't stop you if I tried, my friend. No, it's going to happen. <laughs> in Danish, you can say about a person that that person is helt elektrisk, which means completely electric. It means that they're very excited about something, possibly a little too much. But I would rather be too excited than not be excited at all. And I think that's why when you came up with the name Electric Enthusiasm, that it resonated so much with me. I love it. Good name. I think this is also something that we might have in common. Correct me if I'm wrong. But particularly when I lived in the UK, you know, British people, maybe they're a little bit too much like that New York reviewer, Alex Wolcott, because I sometimes would get uh, told that I was too much, that I was a lot. And I think what it actually was is that they were just seeing my enthusiasm and my energy. I am an unironically enthusiastic person. And sometimes I think to maybe like a British person who's quite reserved, it comes across as a bit strange, maybe a bit insincere. And I always loved it when I managed to win people over, like some people who are a little bit like, ooh, she's a bit much, she's a bit too much, like calm down. They would see that like, no, this energy, this, this, this spark inside of me, it's so genuine. It's so, so, so real. And I just want to share it with you. And then once I kind of got people on side and then they would realize that, oh, okay, this isn't an act. This isn't a facade. This is just genuine, unironic excitement about life. I really like this idea that it can become a catalyst for change when it's sincere and you have to show people the sincerity of your enthusiasm. I like that. I, I once talked to a lady, I met her for the first time and we're chatting. And of course I'm being very enthusiastic. And at one point she says, wow, you get excited really easily, don't you? And I'm going, yeah, thank you. And it was only years later that I realized that she meant it as criticism. <laughs> nope. That's a compliment, my man. That is a compliment. <laughs> All the way. I think both of us have that capacity for enthusiasm. And if you do, I think the only right thing to do is to monetize it. And that's why we made this podcast. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Thank you for that. <laughs> so this is a brand new podcast. And if you are as enthusiastic about enthusiasm as we are, please consider helping us out and uh, spreading the word. I don't know about you, but the best way for me to learn about a new podcast is if one of my friends recommends one to me. So it would make us super happy if you enthusiastically spread your love of enthusiasm by telling your friends about electric enthusiasm. Can I say enthusiasm more times? No. Electric <laughs> enthusiasm. Tell your friends about it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> we really hope you enjoyed sharing some of our enthusiasms in this episode. Please visit our website at electricenthusiasm.com or find us on Instagram at electricenthusiasm to discover more episodes or leave a comment. And now I would invite you to take this time to go away and listen to something with intention.